So with that said, the DOT wants to see you doing the safety management cycle. They want to see policies and procedures, roles and responsibilities, qualification and hiring, training and communication, monitoring, tracking, and meaningful action. The whole purpose of this, and the, the regulations are minimum standards, and a lot of people don't understand. They, I, and I was one of those people, I got to say. 20 plus years ago, I was one of those people. I thought the DOT was picking on me. I thought they were stupid. I thought the rules were stupid. I thought it was all stupid. Um, they're not. Most of these regulations were written because somebody died. Most of these regulations were written because somebody did something really dumb. It shouldn't have happened and it caused somebody else to be injured or killed. So they created these regulations to protect not only your drivers, not only you, but also the public. Um, they're minimum requirements. They know that. The DOT, whenever they come out to audit you, they know that there are minimum requirements. So they don't just look at the requirements. They look at you, a good investigator, and I've seen some pretty poor investigators. Um, for the most part, it's been a long time since I've seen a really bad investigator. Well, a couple years, but that's been before that. It's been a really, really long time. Most of them do a really good job. Most of them take their job seriously. They actually care about what they're doing because they go into companies and they see how they're operating and they see what is happening. They're killing people. I mean, their drivers are killing people. They're killing people. Things are, bad stuff is happening. And if they would have just followed the minimum regulations, probably wouldn't have happened. Um, the minimum vehicle maintenance violations the, or regulations, the, the minimum driver qualification. It is not difficult to hire a driver to do a road test to run that driver's MBR, to run the PSP, even though the PSP is not even required, um, but they give it to you, that's a resource that you have to make sure that that's, he's even a good driver. But so many companies now, and I'm sure you're not one of them. And if you are, you're watching this video, you're watching this webinar, you're watching this training, so that um, maybe you're trying not to be that. Maybe back whenever I started, I didn't wake up one day and say, hey, I think I'm going to kill somebody today. That's not that's not the way owners operate. That's not the way anybody operates, really, unless you're just kind of a psycho. But um, nobody just wakes up and says, hey, I think I'm going to tell my driver to go mow down some people today. That's not what we think. That's not what I thought. That's probably not what you think. But it happens. And it's they call them accidents because they're accidents. Well, of course, lawyers are going to twist it all the different ways that they want, but they call them accidents because they're accidents. But sometimes there are things that you could have done to prevent that if you would have just followed up on a couple other things. Did you do that road test? Did you did you actually ride with that driver to make sure he already that he knew how to back up, that he knew how to make those t corners? Um, Maybe he's an unsafe driver. Did you look at the MVR? Did you look at his history? Did you call the previous employers? Why do you think they have you call the last three years of previous employers? Because they want those employers to tell you, no, he's a horrible driver. Do they say that in the regulation? No, they don't say that in the regulations. They're not allowed to. But that's kind of obvious. And anybody that's been a safety manager, anybody that's been in safety long enough knows that if another safety manager calls me, if I call a safety manager and I say, hey, um, I submitted this previous employment request and I'm calling, I'm not calling the HR department, I'm calling you as a safety manager, you as his supervisor. You know, HR said that he got fired, they wouldn't rehire him. There was big bold letters that said, you know, would not rehire. What's going on here? A lot of times safety managers will talk to each other because they care because they care about the safety of their other drivers. They care about the safety of the public. And, and I'm not saying for you to go violate somebody's HIPAA rights. I'm not saying for you to go violate somebody's right to work or whatever. Um, what I'm saying is that if somebody's a danger to other people in a truck, don't put them in your truck. Um, I'd rather, honestly, for me, I would rather get sued by the state or by workers, labor law, whatever, um, because I didn't hire somebody who I felt wasn't safe than hire somebody who wasn't safe that I knew wasn't safe and hope that he didn't get in a crash. That's up to you, though. So just saying. The rules are minimum requirements. Um, the DOT knows it. The FMCSA knows it. The cops know it. 
The investigators know it, you know it, they're minimum requirements. They want you to go above and beyond. So um, you can be stricter than the regulations. Some states have rules about what you can do and can't do. Um, but at the end of the day, if you don't feel like somebody's safe, if you feel like somebody's an accident waiting to happen, and we all have all heard that before, I think, you know, I tell it to clients all the time, this guy's an accident waiting to happen. Um, if you hear that, if you get that feeling in your chest, if you feel an, a bit of that guy's an accident waiting to happen, don't hire him. Don't keep him. You know, train them. If you want to keep them, if you love them that much, train them and train them and retrain them and retrain them before you let them be in a truck by themselves. I don't say people don't deserve a chance because I feel like they do. But sometimes people shouldn't be in a truck. So after the crash, we're talking about the internal review board after the accidents and incidents. Like I said, um, have that internal review board. They should be bringing the driver in, you know, you have to go through this review board now. He needs to explain to him, explain to the board what happened in this crash. And this is for anything, any incident. If he drops a hammer on his toe and he has to go to the doctor for it, any kind of incident that happens, you should have some kind of review board um, because that's how you mitigate things. That's how you you are investigating it right then and there. You're not waiting two months to investigate. You're investigating it that week. You know, if it happened on Monday, you're putting that review panel together on Tuesday or on Wednesday, and you're saying, what happened? Why did you drop the hammer on your foot? Why did you back into the, the bay doors? Why did you do this? What happened? What was going through your mind? You make them explain that. Um, and then that board together decides what the corrective action would be, whether that driver is going to be terminated, whether they're going to need remedial training. At the very least, if they did something stupid, they should go through some kind of corrective action, some kind of remedial training. Okay, well, I get it. It was dark out. You couldn't see the doors, whatever. You backed into them. Um, how about we do some backing training? Let's, let's go and do this. I'm going to have so-and-so with you. We're going to do some training. We're going to go around the yard. I'm going to have you back up a few times, give you a few tips, tricks, blah, blah, blah. Maybe that's the corrective action that you set forth. Um, but at the very least, there should be some kind of standard process that anybody has to go through. I mean, it, it does help. Honestly, it, very do it does very much help for company morale. Um, and whenever other drivers see drivers making mistakes, it really bothers them whenever they see somebody making a lot of mistakes and not nothing happening. Because then they start thinking, well, why should I do it better? Why should I do it right if he doesn't have to? If you just apply the same rules, apply the same standards to every single person that works there, even the boss's son, even the boss's daughter, even the your wife's cousin's brother's sister's dog's owner that you love very much and he's a great guy and blah 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 he's my best crew hand what you do for one you have to do for all so apply the same standards to everybody and sometimes that means yes you have to fire people you like but that's why the board's there so that you don't always have to be the bad guy freeze all the documents so anytime a crash happens especially sometimes it's not always necessary if it's a minor fender bender if it's not something that's going to cause litigation um, but anytime there's a major bodily injury um, or a fatality, freeze the documents, which means all hours of service from that the time of the accident and prior going back at least seven days, you should freeze. Um, all the documents related, any pictures, everything should just be frozen. There should be nothing terminated. And I hear a lot of I hear a lot of suggestion from consultants from other people that say, well, wait for the attorney to, you know, take six months. And if it's been six months, then throw away that the stuff that you can, that you legally can. Um, for one, that's not for you to decide. So you're freezing all the documents, you're giving it to your attorney, and that's that. Let your attorney make that decision. But if, unless you're an attorney, don't make that decision. Um, let your insurance company handle that. You freeze the documents. If you're doing things properly, you won't have to worry about anything anyway. Um, but if you throw away the documents, the opposing party, all they're going to say is, well, of course you threw them away because he was obviously in violation 
And you're gonna say, no, he wasn't. And yeah, nobody throws stuff away if it can prove that they were innocent, but people keep things whenever it will prove that they were innocent. And that's what an opposing attorney will say. So my recommendation is freeze all the documents. Um, communicate with your insurance and legal team. So a lot of times what will happen is that you don't hear anything. And it's a little frustrating because your insurance company doesn't necessarily hear anything. Uh, we had a fatality back a, a long time ago um, in the 90s. Um, there was a fatality and we didn't hear a whole lot of anything. I mean, it took years. Uh, it was two and a half years before anything really occurred. There was always stuff going back and forth, but it takes a long time, especially whenever it's a case, a major bodily injury or a fatality like that. It can take years. So um, don't feel like that they have to communicate with you every day. At the very least, your insurance company um, should be telling you what to expect. And that's not unusual. So sometimes it's going to be if you're not the officer of the company, you're not going to necessarily hear about it, but the officer of the company will. So, um, you know, that's between you, the officers of the company. If you are the officer of the company, that's between you and your insurance company, you know, to figure out how much communication do you want. A lot of times they're going to make decisions that you don't like. You're going to say that wasn't my fault. I don't want them to pay that claim. Believe me, if it's between settling and going to court, you want them to settle even if it's not your fault. Period. You just do. Take my word for it. If it comes down to settle the case or go to court, you would always rather settle. It's um, for one, it's faster, it's cheaper, it's easier, and Court is very unknown. A jury is very unknown. Way too many factors involved. So a lot of times, most companies will probably settle. Um, communicate. Keep all related information in separate files. So once that accident has occurred, like I said, you're going to freeze all those documents. You're going to keep that in a separate file. You're not going to keep all this accident-related stuff in this driver's qualification file or even in his personnel record. You're going to have a completely separate accident file, um, whether this be in a digital format or whether it be you know, in a filing cabinet on paper, however you want to, however you do that, you want this to be a completely separate thing. So Yes, are you going to have to print out copies or make copies of his driver qualification file and all that stuff? Probably. Um, but do that. Make copies of his driver qualification file, anything that the attorney is going to want to see. Because after a while, they're going to call you and they're going to say, hey, send me a driver's, you know, the driver's file and the accident file. It's just easier to have everything all prepped in, in one place. Um, you're going to put the police report in there. You're going to put any photos, any things like that. You're going to put all the information related to that accident in that one folder because at some point your attorney or the insurance company will call you and say, I need a copy of that. So at that point, you can just have it all together. At the very least, if the DOT comes in, they're going to ask you for that accident file. And if it was not preventable, at that point, now it's ready to go. You can contest preventability with that and say, hey, I want to contest preventability. Here's my accident folder. And then you can explain that and they can choose whether to use that during the, um, against your, with your scores, your rating or not.